Welcome back to the Mitchell Show, Brenda. So we're still here in Fashion Day in Sydney, where we get to meet crazy people in the park, getting involved in uplifting and changing people's lives for the better. And uh, what a better time to speak about community news. With me in studio, I have the co-founder of the Leisure Times. We'll say his dad is the founder, uh, Wasim Kavradin. Thank you so much for joining me today. Um, you've actually taken out the time out of your day to join us here in the studio. So we feel really honored to have you here. Uh, yeah, assalamu alaikum, Nafisa. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I think this is my first time I'm speaking on Salam Media. So it really is an honor to be here and it is a busy time. We're actually on our deadline for our end November month end edition. Yes, and I know it's, it's a very hectic time because you start from now and then it goes out towards the end of November. But um, I, I think I, I should say we feel honored here as the Salam mm -hmm. Media team that you've taken out this time to come and mm -hmm. chat with me about community news and views happening in and around Lanasia. And there's a lot of hot and happening topics um, that you've been covering. And I think one of them will bring to light was, of course, this by-elections that took place. Let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah, it's actually still a very hot topic in Lanasia right now. Um, it's, it's you know there was a lot of build up to it. Um, actually, um, to give a bit of background and maybe a bit of timeline. I mean, if yeah, you remember, sure. uh, four years ago we had the South African uh, national, well, not national, municipal elections, which is where pretty much every uh, municipality in South Africa, not not just Johannesburg or Gauteng, the entire country were busy electing. Um, you know, the, the, the municipal governments, the local governments. Right. And that, of course, included um, uh, at ward level, uh, you know, l like Lanasia, like w whichever other suburb you stay in, where councillors were elected. And so it was won four years ago by a gentleman called Kishore Badal of the Democratic Alliance. And he served his term, and he, his term would obviously would have uh, normally expired now when the next South African municipal elections um, was set to uh, set to occur, which is next year, sometime in the latter half of next year. Right. And um, of course, in July, I think it was or August, he resigned from his post as ward councillor. And um, he subsequently also resigned from the Democratic Alliance. And because of his resignation, uh, there was a need for a by-election in Lanasia. Mm. Um, uh, obviously, for his successor, or even for he himself to replace himself, if that's how you want to put it, because he ran as a candidate yes, and I as well. There was a lot of conflict and, and, and unhappiness going on in that particular ward with people. Um, mm -hmm. As far as um, you know, the councillor was concerned, uh, I don't think they were quite happy with the type of service that was being produced there. Um, yeah, well, I mean, obviously that that would be subjective. I mean, there'd, there'd be some yeah. people who would say he did a fantastic job, others who would criticize uh, him on certain aspects. Um, so, yeah, there, there, there were divisive issues of it. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the, the main thing was his resignation, uh, for whatever reason, and, and he'd be best able to answer that, uh, prompted the need for a by-election. Yeah. And, of course, as a result of the by-election, I mean, we had, uh, I think it was eight candidates yes. who contested the election. And one of them was the Al Jamaa party. And it's so phenomenal. And, I mean, because yeah. like a lot of the times when you look at a by-election, mm -hmm. um, I think generally a general consensus amongst people would be is either there's a DA or an ANC person that's going to come into play when it comes oh, to yes, these yes. kind of things. Yes, but it's phenomenal to see yeah. uh, that, I mean, of course, in this particular ward that the Al Jamaa party has finally taken over that particular area. Yes, it, it, it is. And uh, I mean, it, it shows that also maybe to a certain extent, we, we could say that the people of, of that particular ward, and maybe Lanasia generally, um, are perhaps maybe tired of the of the big parties um, and want to try something different now, want to go for um, maybe another party. I'd agree with you. I think they're probably looking for a fresh, fresh perspective because yeah. I think people are tired of, you know, the promises that are made and they're not fulfilled uh, by any of the councillors, mm -hmm. irrespective of what party they come from. I think they're looking for that particular individual that can mm -hmm. fulfill their needs in their communities. Yeah, no, 100%. I mean, and I always, uh, when I try, when I describe to people, people often ask me, what, uh, you know, what is this by-election? What are municipal elections? You know, what's the difference between it and national elections? And to explain that, I mean, you'd, you'd probably have to give uh, quite a lengthy talk to people <laughs> right. over it. But the, but the gist of it is basically that when it comes to municipal elections, uh, fundamentally, it, it's more about the individual than the party, especially at ward level. 
because um, you because need a capable individual. I agree with you because I mean the thing is you're living in that particular party. area yes. and that what particular person is representing you at council. Mm. Um, looking at your challenges that you're experiencing Correct. in your community, expecting them to of course uplift and empower your community uh, with the challenges that you're facing, uh, and that's what you look for in in that particular person. And I think this is what they found in Imran Musa, and, and this is mm -hmm. the reason why he's won this particular award. Yes, look, uh, Imran's, I mean, as you can see on our front page headline, we've, we've described him as son of Lanesian yes, soil. Yes, I see that. Um, I mean, that, that's not an exaggeration. I mean, those who know him within the Lanesia community will remember him from, I think, you know, almost 40, 40, 45 years ago when he had the famous Grand Cafe, which was right. which was um, one of the famous uh, uh, cafes on, on one of the prominent streets of Lanesia, yes. Kemsbok Avenue. And so he's been he's been there ever since, and of course he's he's done a lot of other um, you know he's founded a lot of other businesses or com community initiatives since then. One of the most notable being the Khidmatul Awam, right? Uh, Jan Umrah uh, pilgrim services. So I mean he obviously built a very good relationship with a lot of people in the community through that as well. Yeah, and I think and so uh, well what people are looking town. for is that proactiveness. So you see the proactivity in this particular mm -hmm. person and you know that he's that type of person that's going to, of course, uh, try and do his best to be able to move that particular ward into a better space. Yes, absolutely. And and look, I mean, it, essentially, I mean, I, I would imagine and, and speaking to him, he explained to me that uh, a lot of his work in the Hajj and Umrah uh, facility, uh, field rather, um, put him in good stead for a position like this because it, it essentially involves working with people mm. and, uh, you know, working with all kinds of people with, 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 differ with differing needs and different, uh, differing circumstances. And it's essentially the same as, as um, you know, helping people mm. within a town Most in a municipal definitely. sense. So it, it was sort of right up his avenue. If you think. Yeah, well, well done to him. I mean, uh, I think people are evidently watching to see mm -hmm. what differences uh, he's going to be able to make in that particular ward. Um, yes, for sure. The Lanesia Times has some really interesting stuff. I mean, uh, we just uh, covered lockdown behind the mask, um, was mm -hmm. it last week? Okay. And uh, we were speaking up to, to all the different authors, and it's such a phenomenal book. Uh, what a nice book review. Um, each book had its, uh, you know, each story, or should we say out of this anthology, there's, there were 18 authors. And each author's story, although whether it was fiction or nonfiction, was so interesting because I think each one had a, a phenomenal message that they would like to bring forward. What mm -hmm. was your take on this? Yeah, no, I was I was quite impressed. Um, uh, the author of this particular article reviewing the book is uh, Shai Statok, and she's yes. a famous life coach in Lanesia, Johannesburg. And I, I thought it was um, very good how there was um, diversified views of, of lockdown, mm -hmm. uh, of people's experiences in lockdown, whether in a fictional or non-fictional sense how it was uh, incorporated in this book. Of course, I've not read the book, so yeah. I wouldn't know exactly I, what, I spoke what to it the was. Authors, what's I in think it. it was a week ago, just mm -hmm. a, a few days just prior to the event. And what I found so phenomenally interesting, although the, some of the stories were, uh, you know, as we say, they were not true stories, mm -hmm. the stories that they thought of, but each one had a, a message which was so phenomenal. Mm -hmm. I think it brought light um, should we say, you know, when, when, when we were going through COVID-19, I don't know about you, but the message that I had for everybody on my show every week was it was a time to reflect, reconnect and retrospect. Those three R's always came to light, making us think back about what are we doing in our lives? Are we reflecting on our lives? Are we reconnecting with our creator, reconnecting with our families? Because we live this, the, these lives where we sometimes walk, walk past each other. Um, you know, there's times where in our families, we so hectically busy, each one so busy in their own thing that we have to make time for each other. Whereas COVID-19 did totally the opposite. It brought us all together. Yes, I mean, in a lot of ways, COVID-19 was like a double-edged sword. It, it, it yeah. had its disadvantages, and we, I mean, those are well publicized. But it also had numerous benefits, such as what you've exactly described, the three R's. And it, it caused people to introspect more about where they are in life and all that. And I would imagine that in this book, there's probably a lot of descriptions of that nature. Yes, and I'm sure those people definitely. who are going to eventually get copies and read this book would probably find uh, that theme coming through as right. they read it. Talk to me about the other stories that you've covered here. There's some interesting stories going on here in the Malaysia Times. And although it's a mid-month one, it's uh, uh, something that I can't stop reading. So I'm going to have to take a copy home. I appreciate home. that, yeah. Yeah, look, we, we, you know, I've always uh, the said Lanesia Times, uh, under, um, you know, during the tenure I've been editor of this newspaper, the po policy I've always put into place is that Lanesia Times needs to be like a, a box of quality streets. Every <laughs> article, everyone has a favorite you. article in there. 
So and I think we it's relatable a stories. Lot. And also, I think what I love about the Lanesia Times is um, it's very community based in the sense, um, you know, you're not only top. Uh, basically bring it to four the negatives but the positives are always bring brought to the fore and you're always enticing the communities to be able to move into better spaces uh, and become better people um, enticing them into of course empowerment as well and i think that this is what the newspaper stands for is a lot of that empowerment going on yes because there's a lot of positive things also happening in Lanesia, as i'm sure everywhere and uh, those things should not be uh, sidelined or you know not highlighted they, they need to be exposed they need yes. to be brought to the fore and that can hopefully make a difference also in people's lives. And, and that's the role, I mean, I'm sure you guys also at, at Salaam Media yes. probably uh, see similar, that we have, a, we have a responsibility to try and help uplift people through these media platforms. Most definitely, and I think it's about empowerment. I mean, when we look at ourselves mm -hmm. with, uh, syncing with you, um, I think we understand it uh, a, a lot with what you're doing because this is our motto, is exactly. to be able to go, and, and the motto of the show as well is to be able to inspire, educate, uplift, um, and, and, and help those that are in dire need. And a lot of the times, the Indonesia Times during the COVID-19 period had gone out to be able to shed some light on what was going on, oh, to yes. be able to reach out to those people that were in dire need. Yes, and I mean, during COVID, I mean, there was a lot of positive stories coming. I mean, if you look at the philanthropic work and humanitarian work that was done during it, I mean, it was all inspiring. And, and we've got several publications, and not just only service in Asia. We have some that also uh, service the Pretoria and northern Johannesburg area. Right. And, and in, in, in areas such as Lodium, um, near Lodium, there was so much of tremendous good work, humanitarian work that was done during COVID. And, and those are the things we want to feature and, and highlight so people can be aware that good work is being done, mm. whether the circumstances in the world are good or bad. Yeah, and it's about bringing out the positive so that people get enticed into better spaces. Now, there's one story here that really stands out for me. Mm -hmm. It's firearms and fabulosity. A gun is a tool, you are the weapon. by <laughs> Zahira B. Talk to me about this story. Yeah, well, actually, I mean, it's, it's um, you know, Z Zahira B, she's a well-known personality in our town. She's very inspirational. She's a life coach. Um, you know, she she's a philanthropist also. She's a humanitarian. She's she's always um, she's a she's a relentless individual, who's always striving to do good work, uh, in the community and always finding initiatives, uh, upliftment initiatives. And recently, um, one of the things she experimented with, or she or she decided to to take up, was uh, firearms. And of course, she's not doing it purely for the purpose of just the thrill of using a firearm. I mean, I've never used a firearm myself, <laughs> so I don't know I. what, so what, what it's when like. When I looked at this, it stood out for me because, yeah. I mean, you wouldn't normally fathom a, a woman with such a big uh, automatic weapon in their <laughs> yeah, hand. Oh, yes, look at that picture, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah I don't know at, if we can lift yeah. this up and, 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 and our, uh, our people can I, see I what is so, going yeah. on there. I think there. people should see um, the weapons. It's that phenomenal to see a lady there. with such a huge weapon in her hand. Uh, yeah. Talk to me about this. What was the idea behind this? Is well, she uh, trying to empower herself? or? Yeah, it, it's a form of empowerment. I mean, I think if you, if you go through the article, fundamentally why, why she's actually doing this is, is not just for the thrill or the um, you know, aesthetics of it. it. It's more to try and encourage women that perhaps, uh, you know, in dangerous times, they, they should consider uh, obtaining firearms for their personal safety. Of course, she doesn't uh, encourage uh, recklessness with it. She encourages right. people to, if they're going to, if they're going to pursue uh, utilizing firearms or, or employing firearms as part of their of their safety measures, then they have to be responsible uh, as well. And so our article describes all of that. Um, it explains, you know, that you've got to approach this responsibly and that um, you've got to have knowledge um, and you've got to make sure that you get the right sort of training before you can take a firearm. But it's also a sense of empowerment in that. I, I like it, the idea of this article because I think it, it makes us as women think how vulnerable we can be to situations. And I mean, two to three weeks ago, I interviewed a, a, a woman who actually saved another lady from uh, being kidnapped. Oh, okay. Um, and it was such a phenomenal story. But th yeah. the thing is, nothing stopped her. She just literally screamed her way to get help. Um, and it's about having to empower yourself with the types of situations we are facing nowadays. Unfortunately, we're in a space right now where our crime levels are quite high. And um, as women, we seem to be more vulnerable uh, when it comes to this particular situation. Yes, that's true. And also you've got to remember, unfortunately, our societies have become such that there are a lot of single moms out there nowadays. Yes. There's a lot of women who don't have that protection of males like in, in the old days, you know, where mm -hmm. marriages were more stable and... Uh, you know, the husband was there to protect and, and you know, the, the extended family members. A lot of women are living alone, living with their children, things like that. 
And so they need to find ways and means to, to try and protect themselves. And maybe this uh, might be one of the options women might, might now start looking at, mm. um, inspired, by, of course, by Zaira. Uh, what I love about you, your um, articles and, and the way you put this together is that, you know, it's like a holistic type of, of thing yes, that you're yes. doing. I see there's a missing person there, and there's no better way than reaching out through this. It's actually very scary. Um, we know that, you know, child ab- abduction, hijackings, kidnappings are so rife nowadays, including armed robberies and uh, cash in transit heists that are going on. And missing people, I think, is the most important thing because they actually sometimes get lost in that whole situation where you put up a picture or two and two weeks later it's forgotten. Yeah, it's like they literally get, get lost in the situation, and unfortunately. I mean, this particular kid, I, I think he was uh, he's 15 years old. He, he's been missing since yeah, August. No Shame. And and that's a worry because it's it's a substantial amount of time that he's he's been away from his family now and and we we can only hope for the best that he is alive and well somewhere and he'll get found soon. But and uh, it's so nice to see you reaching out to on behalf of the family can. because the thing is at the end mm-hmm. of the day we can only try and imagine what that poor family must be going Definitely. through every yeah. single day not knowing whether that poor child is alive or or not. Yes, it's a harrowing experience for particularly his parents. I mean, they, you know, the, the all sorts of thoughts must be going through their heads right now. And that is why we just hope that people are, um, you know, paying attention to this sort of article. And, and and if they come across something that could help find him, hopefully alive and well, right. that, that would mean a lot. And, and let's uh, hope they do. I see you're also bringing uh, other topics to the fore that matter, like fraud, um, armed robberies, um, tampering with essential infrastructures. So people are aware in the communities of what is happening around them. And I think that's phenomenal because um, it makes you wary when you go out there that, you know, in this particular area, this is what I need to be wary of. Um, and I think if it's not brought to light, sometimes what happens, we do put our guards down Absolutely, and we find yes. ourselves in a situation that we didn't actually anticipate ourselves to be in. Yes, definitely. And, and you know, I mean, just I mean, this is just crime within the Lanasia area. And you can see it. it it's almost it's one huge, and a eh? half pages worth <laughs> yes, of crime it's news. Huge, it's and, and this was just in the last um, 15 days. And, and this much of crime. And this is what, what we were informed about. There's a whole lot more, I'm sure, that happened uh, as well that we weren't given um, full information on. And that just shows you the levels of crime that, that we're unfortunately dealing with. In a town like Lanasia. I mm. mean, um, I can't speak for other areas, but but this this shows you the problem. And I mean, just this is just mm. one particular area. Imagine what is going out throughout all the other communities as such. Yes, throughout South Africa as a yeah. whole, and, and that's and what's uh, worrying. It's, it's I think what uh, bringing uh, shedding light on this matter is important because I think it's about time we also you know become active citizens. It's Definitely. not just only about government and SAPs. It's about becoming active citizens, being proactive, being able to be a- be able to help each other. And by you doing this, um, allows us to create a space to warn others to say, look, there's that type of fraud that happened there. Yes, and this yeah. is what you need to look out for. So um, I, th- I think this particular section is phenomenal because what it does is it educates us about uh, the, the dangers that are out there and how we can uh, empower ourselves besides, of course, having a, a, a weapon with us. Yeah, I mean, we- weapons is one aspect, but awareness <laughs> exactly. is, is another important aspect. And if people are, are, are reading this, they will they will see the diversified crimes that you get. Not just it's not your typical robbery or chain snatching crimes that you have to be worried about. There's all kinds of different crimes, and and also, I mean, uh, you know, we read about issues like child neglect, for instance. It's it's also within homes that there, there, there mm. appears to be crimes that are committed. And yes. um, I mean, in our upcoming edition, this this next one. I mean, we, we're hoping to have a feature on, on domestic violence abuse. And I think that's yes, something that um, we should also be focusing on I think it's a very well. to- uh, important it's topic. A um, that, I've spoken to so many women across the board, and, and there's mm-hmm. so many organizations that we've spoken to about GBV. Yes. Um, and I think uh, still being in that, should we say, COVID lockdown scenario going slowly out, it's still very rife out there. Uh, the gender-based violence that is going on, it's, it's actually scary when, you, when I speak to certain individuals um, that I tap into with organizations to be able to understand how bad it's really gone. And um, I think it's being able to, to change things and, and, and educate people, whether it's men or women, um, about how you know, to, to actually go about standing up for themselves. Yes, and unfortunately a problem I've, I've noticed, um, I mean, is a lot of, women, I would say, um, who are in, in abusive situations, tend not to want to come out with it. 
um, you know, for, for for numerous reasons, and we don't. It's have to the go element into of them, fear. But, it's the element of yes. being uh, stigmatized as such to say, you know, she's yes, been abused. Yes, stigmatization. Um, one of them, and yes. and I think it becomes a so-called taboo subject, like yeah. drugs and all the other things. Yeah. But I think it's important for for listeners to understand that you you bring these things to the fore because there are support structures out there that can change Definitely. their lives for the better. And I think that's what it's about: is being able to educate them to say, you're not alone. Uh, go out there, take a stand for yourself. We're not saying, uh, you know, get aggressive or violent or anything, but uh, stand up for yourself uh, in, in a certain way. And each one has value. I always believe in one thing, you know, uh, Wasim, each person has value to themselves. And by, by allowing yourself to be abused in, in, in a type of uh, relationship or situation, uh, it, it actually strips your value from yourself because you, you start thinking less of yourself as an individual. Yes, and one of the things I've, I've noticed also is, is a lot of the abuse cases is, is, tends to be related to drug abuse itself. Um, I mean, that, that's sure, what that, I'm picking that is up very from, scary. from the issue of, of abuse. Right. Um, a, a lot of so um, it's, what you're saying is it's stemming from there. Basically, people are. Uh, that's what I'm picking yes. up um, with my ear on the ground in the community is that a lot of the abuse cases tend to happen where one of the partners might be, um, you know, involved in substance abuse, and and that causes um, you know the irrational behavior Most and ultimately definitely. the aggression and violence that we don't want to hear about but within Indonesia there are numerous support structures to to help with this I mean if you if you turn the page you'll actually see on, on the next page we've got um, Nishtara for instance celebrating yes, 30 years that's right I mean they want such uh, organization that uh, you know um, are trying to rehabilitate people who and they been. have I mean they've been doing such amazing work for yeah. this many years the, the amount of people that they've rehabilitated and changed their lives for the better yeah I, I find it uh, yes, uh, really years, you know yes. it's mind-blowing uh, and this is this is the thing we want people to understand that if somebody is under substance abuse through your articles is to say that you don't you're not alone um, don't think it's a taboo subject and that it's not something where you can go for help. Because I always believe in one thing, and I, and I don't know if you'll agree with me, uh, no. is when a, one person is on substance abuse, it's not that person that's only affected. It's the entire family that gets yeah, absolutely. affected. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, uh, entire families' lives have been devastated in, in various ways. I mean, I'm sure you guys have probably done programs on it. Yes. And we've had articles on it of how lives can be affected in various ways. And we, we've partnered with Nishtara now recently where they will submit to us articles uh, describing the various types of, of, of uh, substance abuse. And, and not just only drugs, it can even be alcohol and, and any intoxicant that, that has destructive uh, Yeah, and I think that's needed is to be able to educate the community to say that, you know, substance abuse is not just taking drugs. These are the things you need to look for. And these are the yes. symptoms that, uh, that you need to look for as well. Because sometimes a person really knows how to hide it well, but oh, their yes. behavior says something else. Yes, yes. And uh, I mean, it, it, it can be, yeah, like, like you've, you've correctly said, some people are good at concealing, but um, it, it does manifest in other ways and it eventually does become problematic for households, for families, even for mm -hmm. the individual themselves, for the companies they work for and so forth. Right. So, um, I'm really enjoying reading the the thing today, uh, and you. I see you've got uh, the history of Gravel Swimming Pool, home to Atlantis Swimming Club. Yeah, That's this, nice. this is this is a fascinating article um, that that we printed. I mean, you know, Atlantis Swimming Club, a phenomenal swimming club, not just in Indonesia. I would say even in South Africa, the amount of top quality swimmers this club is producing, and it's a pity now during COVID we cannot see um, the manifestation mm. of that talent. Right. Um, but I can assure you, before COVID, um, if we go back to a few years ago, the types of um, talent they were producing and, and are continuing to produce, and the types of achievements swimmers from this club uh, from this club was producing, was phenomenal, and they are worthy of having a, a, a designated pool for themselves, where their swimmers can train in, can perform in, they can have galas um, uh, at, and I'm glad to see that Gravel Swimming Pool is now very much uh, for them. And it's so nice to see this because this is the whole idea, you know, it's getting uh, young people involved at, uh, with things that matter and then and it keeps them out of that dangerous environment as well. It keeps them busy in a good space. Absolutely. I mean, it ties in with what we were just talking about previously. Yeah, exactly. I mean, drug abuse. I mean, it probably stems from, from, you, know, from uh, you know, a whole lot of factors. And one of the ways you could... You could uh, uh, avoid people going to, to drug abuse and all this through sport. I mean, we've always spoke of the, the value of sport. Um, if a young man or young woman takes up sport, 
they, they, they can, uh, you know, they can keep out of trouble. And, and swimming is, is, a, is a very popular sport in Indonesia, believe it or not. It's, yeah, and you know, no, it's nice to see that happening because soccer. a lot of the time uh, our, our Indian kids mostly get involved with soccer and cricket. Yes. That's it. But uh, it's nice to see this happening. Um, I have a friend who actually does triathlons and I was quite amazed to see that a, a young woman... Um, has done the Iron Man three times. Oh, that's impressive. Yeah. <laughs> She's, uh, I even laughed. I said to her, you left some of the guys behind. But it's good to see through this, you're actually enticing people to say, you know what, sport is an amazing thing. Get involved with it. Change your life for the better. And, and you never know what potential you have and what's going to come out from it. And Indonesia has um, got a history of producing some really top quality yes, sportsmen most definitely. In, in various sports, not yes. just necessarily swimming. But, right. and, and, you know, I believe that we'll still see more good talent coming forth from Indonesia. But they need, they need to have the right facilities. And this article describes a gravel swimming pool, which actually has a, a very interesting history. I mean, it, mm. um, it, I think it even got rebuilt, uh, sorry, or refurbished um, right. about 10 years ago. Sure. And that was a period when uh, these swimmers desperately needed the pool. To, to be active again. Right. And you can see this uh, photos of, of children uh, protesting yes. sort of and, and asking for their pool to be returned to them. And now that they've got it, I think, uh, and, and it, it's been proven in the last 10 years, Atlantis uh, as a swimming club, they've gone from strength to strength. And that is because they've got their own facility and it's fully yeah, functional. Yeah, definitely makes such a difference. And it makes a big difference, yes. Yeah. But um, what message would you like to leave our listeners and viewers with this afternoon? Well, I would encourage them to, to continue um, developing awareness of what's going on in their societies through media platforms like Salah Media, like Lanesia Times. I mean, we put a lot of effort into informing people of what's happening in our communities. I see that because there's a very holistic uh, uh, newspaper standing here in front of me. There's a little <laughs> yes. bit of everything. And it's uh, given me this whole holistic version of what's happening around me. So um, just reading this particular Lanesia Times is already taught me so many different aspects of what's happening in your community, which I, th I think is amazing. Um, what I'm saying is I think people should join you uh, and get proactive as uh, the way the Lanesia Times is. Um, and, of course, help create that support structure where we can help each other move forward. And I think this is what the Lanesia Times stands for. Absolutely. And, and awareness is key. Awareness is empowerment. If people are aware of what's happening in their societies and in their communities, and we do our best to, to highlight that in our newspaper. And I'm sure um, Salam Media does its best uh, on the airwaves. Yes. We're always trying our best to make people aware. And people need to pay attention to what we're saying. And they will become more aware. They will become more informed. And it will help them make better decisions to uplift our society in a holistic manner, as you correctly said, yeah, in all aspects of It's a of newspaper life. with a purpose. Exactly. I mean, that, that, that's, that's the role we, we, see, uh, we see for ourselves. You know, we want to make a difference, a positive difference. To our lives, we want to uplift our communities Most so that everyone can live in a much better way. Well, we want to thank the Lanesia Times because, I mean, for following you for this many years in the community as such, um, it, we've always seen those holistic differences and it's not just in one particular field. So oh, we yes. want to commend you on the phenomenal work uh, that started off with your dad, of course, so many yes. years ago and then now followed through with you. Um, we definitely are going to be still following you and creating this long-term relationship to be able to get together and help you move communities forward together. So thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. We wish you nothing but, of course, much more strength um, and much more success. Yes, no, I appreciate that. It was a real pleasure being here, and I look forward to, in future, again describing what's happening within our community um, in, on Salam Media. Well, we hope you're going to be joining us in the next two weeks so that we can do the, the month-end version of the Lanesia Times. Yes, that will be quite interesting. Let, let's see how that goes. We look yes. forward to that. Thank you so much. as alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. That was Wasim Kamruddin from the Lanesia Times, definitely giving us some insight into literally just about everything that we need to look out for. What a holistic uh, newspaper. It's something you need to get your hands on and get involved because it teaches you the word proactivism. Stay with us. We're going to be back with you in a minute.